Howdy folks, welcome back. Got us another broken Ford truck to play around with. This is a 2005 Ford F-150. It's got the three valve Triton hand grenade under the hood. Uh, change engine light is on. It's definitely got a misfire. I can hear it's got the classic Ford cam phaser death rattle on startup. I believe it's been to another shop. Supposedly it's had spark plugs and coils installed. It's got a laundry list of, of DTCs stored in the computer, so I think this is going to be a good one. Okay, I let the Autel do its thing. So it's got nine DTCs stored in the PCM, which is not good. So we got timing codes, looks like. Intake camshaft over retarded. Lean on bank one, and then multiple misfire codes, three, five, seven. Misfire on first thousand revolutions. Cam position sensor. Wow. Ignition coil primary secondary. And then there's a bunch of ABS stuff that we probably aren't going to worry about and stuff for the transfer case. Integrated wheel end circuit solenoid. So we're not going to worry about that for right now. We're working on the engine. We got to figure out uh, what's going on. So I don't know if it's out of time or we got a bad. Uh, cam sensor or crank sensor. Hello family. What are we doing? Somebody wanted to come visit you, so I take it along. Hey kiddo. Are you gonna get all dad's tools out? That's the sharpest one. Can you put that back please? Yeah. But three year olds don't need to hold wood chisels. What about this thing? Um, that's a stud finder. How about the pliers? You want to play with pliers? Yep. They're okay. super sharp. They're... yeah. So be careful with them. The fuel trims aren't great, but they don't look like they're totally out of whack. I don't know why that long-term fuel trim is so high. Got some, definitely got some mechanical noise over here. This side. And I'm saying there's no way those coils have been replaced either. I can't find misfire counters on the Autel for this Ford, so I'm just going to generic OBD2, the mode 6 data. But it looks like cylinder number three is our our main problem. Five and seven have a little bit, but yeah, cylinder three seems to be the the bad one. All right, this is a Ford, so it should be one, two, three, four on this bank. So if I come down here, I should be able to unplug the coil. I don't hear a change, do you? Try two. Oh yeah. Okay, so we're definitely dead on cylinder three. So this should be five right here. Oh yeah, makes a big difference. And then seven. Back here. Okay, so let's let's worry about number three for right now. Well, I don't know. The customer told me that he had the coils replaced. He said they replaced the coils, the boots, and the plugs. I don't know who they are, and I don't know any more details than that, but these sure look like factory coils to me. They've got the paint marks on them still. 
This one here, cylinder number one, I think maybe has been replaced. It looks different than the others. But the other seven coils all look the same. They all have the same part number. So I don't think there's any way that they've changed those, those coils out. So I guess maybe the easiest thing to do right now would be to switch the coil from three to two and uh, see if our misfire moves with the coil. Well, before we go pulling coils and doing the switcheroo, I think it's time to play around with the new toy. This is a four channel Picoscope. It's the automotive variety. I bought this brand new from AES Wave. So here's our scope unit right here. Four channel. They came out with a new model 4425 or 4225, whatever this is. They came out with a new one that has the smart probes so that when you connect them they automatically detect. I don't need that, so I bought the old model, which is now slightly discounted. So it was a good time to buy it, I think. I've needed one for a long time. I've just been, been putting it off because it's, you know, a big chunk of change. So it comes with a little selection of back probes and, I don't know, pr regular probes and clamps and an attenuator. I think this is... Probably broken now. Yeah, it's a 10 to 1 attenuator. So that's good. This is our USB cable that should hook up to our PC. So this is a secondary ignition test lead. So if you have a vehicle that has spark plug wires, you can clip this around the spark plug wire. And I believe it's a capacitive pickup. And then four test leads, one for each channel. So that's all in that box. And then in this box, this is an extension lead for a coil on plug ignition. So you would plug this into the coil and then plug this end onto your spark plug. And then you can use that secondary ignition probe to measure your secondary ignition waveforms just like you could with the normal you know, distributor system where it has spark plug wires. Comes with a ground lead. So I also ordered a paddle probe for the coil unplug ignition. That's supposed to be here maybe tomorrow. And then I ordered some various adapters for BNC to banana jack and whatnot. And then I tried to order the, the U-Test kit, which is all the test leads, but I guess it's on some kind of indefinite back order. So I don't know what's going on. AES Wave's got a lot of stuff on back order right now. It must be stuff coming out of China and they're having trouble getting it because of the coronavirus or, or something like that, or I don't know what, it, what their supply chain is, but for whatever reason, you can't get a lot of stuff right now. Okay, here's a wiring diagram for this coil on plug ignition system. So you got a hot at all times, goes through a 20 amp fuse, through the ignition switch, back into the junction box for some reason, and then out on a red with a light green wire that's going to be a shared power for all of the coils and then the PCM is going to supply a ground to each one individually to actually fire it. So what we're going to do is go up here to this connector C139 and put an amp clamp around this red with light green, light green wire. Okay here's our setup. Pico scope is here. Got an attenuator on channel 2. Channel 2 is hooked into the primary side of coil number 1. And then I've got an amp clamp around this red with light green, light green wire. That should be our feed for all of our coils. There's that connector right there in front of the ECM. And we're going to go ahead and see what we get on the scope. I don't have any fancy screen recorders or anything set up yet. This is literally the first time I've ever used it. Okay, I've got to learn how to use the trigger, but I think this is going to give us what we need to know. Okay, this is fantastic. So you can already see 
the problem. The problem is right here. And I believe on the the 5.4 Triton, the firing order is like 1, 3, gotta look it up. I think it's all odds and then all evens. Yeah, no, that's not exactly right. So the firing order on this truck is 1, 3, 7, 6, 5, 4, 8. So we can already see that we would expect to find a problem on cylinder number three because that's the one we're we're not seeing firing and we definitely have the problem there so let's see can we see any more detail there hmm I might have my clamp on backwards so let's see cool. all right is there an option to invert a channel I guess I don't know how to do that. All right, I'm not gonna make you guys watch me learn how to use the Pico scope. So it doesn't really matter. Ah, oh, man, battery life on this thing is horrible. Because the, the uh, I better plug it in or it's gonna die. Not fast enough, fella. Should have bought a new computer just for the Pico. Or maybe I just need to buy a new battery. This is the junk computer anyway. But I believe it's good enough for this. Okay guys, maybe, maybe we can finally get this to work. Computer battery died, camera battery died, screen recorder died. Uh, Alright, let's try this again. So we're going to zoom in, hopefully. We can figure out how to do it. On these two waveforms. So here is coil number one. Here is coil number three. Firing order is one, three, something. Doesn't matter. So here's your control voltage here on the primary side of the coil. The PCM pulls it down to ground three times for your multi-strike. And here is the current waveform for that coil. Now you see on the second and third strike here, you have a vertical line on the current. I believe that is because the magnetic field has not completely collapsed before the PCM starts trying to charge the coil up for the second and third strike. Now take a look over here at number three, coil. See how we don't have that vertical line? I believe what that's going to indicate to us is that this coil is not building enough magnetic field and then the, the field's actually completely collapsing before the PCM tries to command the second and third strike. So it's pretty cool. It shows us definitively that we have a problem with the number three coil. It also shows us that we don't have a problem with the ECM. And I don't suspect there's a crank input problem or anything like that because the PCM is trying to turn that coil on. It's just the coil's not doing what it's supposed to do. So, finally, at this point, I think we can swap the coil from cylinder number 3 to cylinder number 2 and see if all this nonsense moves along with it. Hmm. When I took this out, it was full of water. It's been water down inside that spark plug well, no doubt about it. And then the spring's all rusty. So, I don't know. I mean, I would think that's enough KVA it could jump. I could jump that, but I don't know that for sure. All right, let's go ahead and put this in number two. I marked it as bad and see what happens. Well, crap, I fixed it. I got nothing now. Zero, 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 zero. I mean, it's still got some counts. I don't know how often this updates, but... Yeah. So, I don't know. It must have been a bad connection between the coil and the plug. There was a bunch of crud down in the bottom of that spark plug well, too. I blew that all out. So, there's one. Three. 
now looks fine. Seven. Two, which is where the bad coil now lives. Well, a few hours later, I make my way back to this truck. I think when we last left off, we had moved the coil from cylinder three up to cylinder number two, and then our misfire went away. So at this point, I think, I don't know what to think. Either the water inside that spark plug well was a problem, or the rust on that the spring inside the, the coil boot. One of those two was the issue. I don't know. But it seems to be fine now. <clears throat> so I think at this point we should move away from the misfires and try to figure out what's going on with this timing issue. This P022. And then we have a P0345 camshaft position sensor. So you see we got a bunch of pending codes here too. Which some of these I'm sure I set by unplugging things while it was running. So, yeah, I don't know. I thought we had a coil F primary voltage or primary something. Ignition coil C primary fault. So that's cylinder number three. So on Fords, it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's A is one, B is two, C is three. So ignition coil C primary circuit fault, that would be cylinder number three. So I probably caused that. And then E and F would be, what, 5 and 7? So that, I guess that makes sense. I unplugged all those cylinders, so. Okay, let's, uh, huh. let's start it up, I guess, and see what's going on with these crankshaft or camshaft positions and uh, go from there. Supervision. Yep, don't screw up. Alright, since we got the Pico scope out and I don't see anything out of the ordinary on the scan tool as far as cam, you know, advanced, retired, whatever, we're gonna try to do a cam crank correlation with the scope. like it's okay yeah. all right one more check I want to make I want to do a manual oil pressure reading so I just took the oil pressure switch out it's in that housing there behind the oil filter and I hooked up a actual oil pressure gauge so fun fact about Ford trucks basically since about 1985 or 86 they've all had fake oil pressure gauges so it shows a gauge on the dash but that gauge is just a switch it doesn't tell you anything other than you have more than 7 PSI of oil pressure. The engine's fully warmed up now. It still has 30 PSI of oil pressure. And I've also put it in gear so that the, you know, the RPMs drop a little bit. It doesn't go below 25, so I think we're okay on oil pressure. It really it runs fine. I don't feel a misfire at all. It just has that, that constant ticking sound. Even back here you can hear it. 
Well, if this is one of the overly dramatic hospital-based TV shows that my wife watches instead of a crappy internet video about fixing a truck, this is the point in the story where we would have our lab test results back and we'd be sitting down for a meeting with the family, telling them to prepare for the worst. So at this time, I think we should set the misfires aside and worry more about these timing codes. So we had a P022, camshaft over-retarded on bank two, and a P0345 for a loss of cam sensor signal. Now, again, I don't know what was done. If somebody unplugged the cam sensors or the cam, the VVT solenoids, I, I really don't know why we have these codes, but we have good cam signal on the scope. We have good cam timing. The waveform that we pulled matches exactly with known good waveforms that I was able to to find for these 5.4 Triton engines. So I'm saying at this point the timing is good, the cam signal is good, at least at the sensor. And I'm not checking it at the ECM. I guess we could be losing it somewhere in the harness. But this truck looks pretty clean. I kind of doubt it. We got good base oil pressure, but we have a ticking noise. And we also have a pretty, pretty severe rattle on startup. You know, it's got that timing chain slap. So probably the tensioners are blown out, but they're not bad enough to where it's caused a problem with the timing. So we got to worry mostly, I think, about this ticking noise right now. And I am leaning towards it being one of the cam phasers. So what happens in these Ford cam phasers, like any other VBT system, it uses oil pressure to basically retard the timing of the camshaft. And there's a little slots inside the, the phaser that fill up with oil and it moves a vein that basically rotates the, the sprocket in relation to the camshaft. And when they're at idle, so when the engine is idling, the camshaft is fully advanced, I believe, and there's a lock pin that's spring-loaded, and the lock pin should lock the, the two halves of the phaser together. And I believe that's the source of the noise on the phasers is this lock pin. When it gets oil pressure from the VVT solenoid, it pushes the lock pin out and allows the thing to advance. So the reason I think that the cam phaser is the source of the noise and not, you know, like a cam follower or a lifter, or not lifter, a valve lash adjuster or the camshaft itself, is that the ticking noise goes away immediately when you hit the throttle. So as an experiment, what we can do is unplug the VVT solenoids and try hitting the throttle again and see if the noise remains. And I think that will definitively tell us that the problem is in the cam phaser. All right, in this test, both VVT solenoids are unplugged. Okay, now the same test with the BBT solenoids plugged in.
Well, I really hope the camera picked that up. So when the VVT solenoids are unplugged, there is no oil in the cam phasers, and it relies on that lock pin to keep the two halves of the phaser locked together. And you can hear, I think, when you raise the RPM, that it still has that knocking sound. However, when you plug the VVT solenoids back in, as soon as you touch the, the pedal, it starts to retard the camshaft, and as soon as it applies oil to that phaser, that knocking, that ticking sound goes away. So after that test, I feel pretty confident that this truck needs cam phasers. And, you know, I don't know if that ticking noise would ever really hurt anything, but it is annoying. And if you want it to be to go away, I think the only way to do that would be to replace the, the phasers. Now, I don't know. Should we go ahead and replace the chains and guides and tensioners and all that crap while we're in there? I really don't know. I don't know. It's only got 119,000 miles on it, so... That seems unlikely unless the actual guides are broken, which, you know, it's a Ford, so that's possible. Anyway, I think the next thing to do would be to talk to the customer. So there's a few other kind of odd things here too. I had a coil F primary secondary code. I didn't see anything on the, the Pico when we measured the current ramp on the coils. I didn't see anything pulling an, uh, an odd amount of current. And then we had that P P0171 lean on bank one. I think that's probably just because of the coil three, uh, the cylinder three misfire. The, I believe it was shutting off the injector to cylinder number three. Cylinder three is in bank one, so I could certainly see that causing a lean code on bank one. Anyway, that's where I'm at with it. Hey, kiddo, what are we doing? What are we working on? Working on Thomas. Yep, we got a little side project here. We got to fix Thomas. Green, green crusties strike again. This little tiny DC motor. One of these little ears was all green and crusty. So I just cleaned it off. I think we're going to be able to fix them right up. Need about eight hands to put this thing back together. Takes these special three sided screw screwdrivers too. Yeah, we're working on Thomas. Okay, I need the top of Thomas. You're welcome. <laughs> Around circles. Yep, he sure does. Okay, you got you got to remember not to put Thomas in the water, okay? Okay. Okay. Well, this truck doesn't look too bad underneath. All things considered, its age and being in Illinois, not bad at all. See, this drive shaft's pretty rusty. The weights are are popping off of that. And then what always happens with these box frame forwards is the eventually the frame starts to go. So you see they put a they put an extra plate on the inside of there, and then you just get that rust jacking and it puffs it out like that. Eventually it'll break the welds and you know the story. Yeah, doing it on both sides of the transmission cross member there. It is leaking pretty bad. Something is leaking pretty bad on the engine. Probably the valve cover gaskets, I think. See the AC compressor is all wet down there. Uh, the front brake pads are pretty well smoked. And then I noticed that the, looks like the rear axle seals are leaking. This side's not too bad. But this side must be blown right out. Pretty much leaking everywhere. Unless it's coming from the caliper. 
I don't know. I think that's... I don't know. I'm guessing that's a axle seal. It's like somebody just put brakes on it. Clips aren't even rusty yet. All right, I had a little chat with the customer. He told me that he still believes that the coils were supposed to have been replaced. Anyway, he tells me that the guy he bought it from, I guess he hasn't had this truck very long, the guy he bought it from thought it had a plugged catalytic converter, which is an interesting theory. So I think we should be able to see that on our fuel trims. If I just kind of give her some gas here, it should go way rich and it, it just doesn't really do that. Yeah, maybe a little bit there on bank two, but. Yeah, I don't think so. Seems to drive fine. I mean, it's not a, a powerhouse, but it's only a 5.4. It's a pretty good sized truck. Uh, I just pulled over. We're missing. It's missing again. Pretty bad. Now it's happy again. Man, that's crazy. Why would it do that? So it set codes for over retarded and over advanced on both banks. So do we have a VVT solenoid problem? Did I plug those back in? So I better check that first. Yeah, whatever it's doing, I just caught it. It's doing it right now. That was crazy. It was stuck at full retard or full advance. Why did it do that? I don't know. Well, this is the event right here. I don't know what's, I don't know what to make of this. So look at what happens on bank two. All of a sudden, the advance just starts going up, 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 from basically zero to 63. And then the advanced error is basically a mirror image of it. Why would it do that? It's like it tried to advance the cam and then it got stuck. And look at bank one. So bank one, the actual advance is, you know, it's like plus or minus two and a half degrees. But then it's showing us an error up to, I don't know how far this goes, it went off the scale. Up to 60, I'm guessing, degrees. So I don't know what to make of that. Seems to happen when I come to a stop after accelerating. So let's see if we can duplicate that. Yeah, right there, it's doing it right now. Why is it showing an error on bank one? So 
So the BBT solenoids are unplugged right now. Completely unplugged. And you see it's just going crazy. It's doing whatever it wants. And now it's fine again. Plug it back in. No change. Wow, this is weird. All I did was restart the engine, now it's fine. <laughs> I told you guys it was going to be a good one. Yeah, it's happy now. Well, the gnats are back, so we're going to have to work around that, but what do you guys think about the engine? Pretty crazy, huh? We obviously have some major problems with the variable valve timing on this, on this engine, and it seems to happen consistently when you come off of the throttle. So you're driving down the road 55 miles an hour, you let off, pull up to a stop sign, all of a sudden it, the timing just goes crazy, and it starts chugging and bucking and shaking, and sometimes it wants to die. You get misfire codes. We got more misfire codes on cylinder 5, cylinder 7, so those are both on bank 2. And you saw the data that we saw on the Autel. I'm not... Not 100% sure what to make of that. I think it's probably, it may not mean exactly what we think it means. I think that there's some, some coding problems as far as the, the variable valve timing data on the Autel. And I don't have the Ford IDS scan tool to confirm that, but or that or that I'm, I'm interpreting the data wrong and it doesn't mean what I think it means. But I'm not exactly sure why that actual position changes and then the error changes in the opposite direction. Uh, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, especially when the duty cycle doesn't change, but uh, it doesn't matter because it seems to happen independent of the PCM's control. I unplugged both of the, the cam, the, the VVT solenoids, and we still had that same problem. So whatever it is, it's not electrical. It is hydraulic, I suspect, or mechanical. So I'd say there's only two options. It's got a bad or sticking VVT solenoid, or it's got a bad or sticking cam phaser. So I think the, the plan of attack here is to pull the valve covers, pull the VVT solenoids, we'll take a look at them, and I think we're going to replace both solenoids and both phasers, and that should take care of the problems on this truck. So I think we'll start over here on the left side of the engine on bank two, and get the valve cover off there, see what we see. I know it is possible to pull that VVT solenoid without pulling the valve cover, but if we got to go out to the phaser anyway, might as well just get it off there. So it looks like there's a bunch of garbage in our way. We got a PCV system, we got the EVAP stuff over here, we got the power steering reservoir and that crazy bracket. And then the reason I went after that misfire first is that I, I suspected we were going to have to pull the valve covers off. And to get the valve covers off, you got to pull the coils out. So. I wanted to figure out that dead miss before we started messing with the coils. Okay, left side valve cover is off. BBT solenoid is out. This takes a T27 Torx, thanks Ford. But, I'm going to show you guys because it's pretty interesting. So, there is your problem, lady screens, filter screens are blown out and I don't know if you can see it on the camera but the spool is actually held open right now. So it's not going to work like that. No sir. And 
pretty sludgy inside the valve covers too. So it hasn't been getting the maintenance that it needs. But wait, there's more. Oh, let me get a pointing device. Let's see if I can show you guys this. I have to give the camera a little reach around. Come on. So what we are looking at right now is the timing chain tensioner. It has a plastic body. And can you guys see that little thing right there? This little spongy guy right there? I believe that's the gasket underneath the timing chain tensioner. It is either blown out or starting to blow out. So that's not good. So the left hand side valve cover is a walk in the park compared to the right side valve cover which is not much fun at all. So I actually chose to suck down the AC. Got the machine on it right now. Pulling the refrigerant out. And I'm going to take this line loose and up here at the evaporator and pull that accumulator out of there so I have room to room to work on it. This is pretty tight. <laughs> Alrighty folks, the timing cover is off and we've got some carnage. So this is one piece of the right side timing chain guide. Down yonder is the other piece of the guide. So we'll have to get that out of there, see if there's any uh, pieces that might have broken off and made its way down into the oil pan. I don't really want to drop the pan, but I guess we, we will if we have to. Doesn't look too good. So there's your second problem, lady. And that certainly would explain our startup death rattle. But wait, there's more. Take a look at this timing cover. So right here, Nice JB weld job on there. Looks like at some point in time the serpentine belt tensioner failed and it chewed a hole right through the timing cover. It, it almost cut a window out of it and somebody went ahead and fixed it with some JB weld. The sad part is it might have actually worked if they would have just done a little bit better job. But yeah, I couldn't figure out where the oil was coming from. The whole right side of the engine is just covered in oil. And I thought that the front main seal was blown out, which it may be a little bit blown out, but not to that degree. But yeah, the oil's coming out of this, of this quality repair here. So I don't know what we're going to do about that. We're probably looking for a new timing cover. So the inside's a little bit chewed up too where that timing chain's been slapping around in there with that broken guide. But you can see right here where that pulley, it chewed all the way through the aluminum timing cover. Pretty crazy. It's amazing to me that someone could let something go that long. I mean, can you imagine the, the racket that must have made? Unbelievable. So anyway, that's how things go for me. It's like the Bermuda Triangle of repairs around here. Well, you guys love carnage, and this engine does not disappoint. So, left side timing chain guide. A little bit chewed up right here, but not too bad. Still in one piece. Both timing chain tensioners look pretty decent, still in one piece. Not too bad on the wear. Those could almost be reused. But it goes downhill from there. Right side timing chain guide, which came out in three pieces. How's this go? Uh, goes like this. And then this piece goes like this. So the big pieces are still here, but we are missing that little V-shaped piece. No idea where that is. Probably in the oil pan. Here is the reluctor wheel for the camshaft position sensor. Pretty well mangled on this side. This tooth here after the skip tooth looks like it's taken a pretty good beating. That is junk. But then it gets really bad from there. There's the tensioner from the left side, I believe. And we were right, the gasket was blown out, but that's not the worst part of it. 
Now this one over here on the right side, the gasket was completely blown out of the tensioner. This couldn't have been holding any oil pressure at all. And check out the aluminum flakes inside. So I'll give you guys one guess where those aluminum flakes came from. Well, I'll just, I'll just show you. So I popped a couple of the bearing caps off of the camshaft. This is the front one. This is actually the first one that I pulled off. And it really doesn't look too bad. So I thought, hey, we're going to get lucky on this engine. Really, it's in pretty good shape. Then I pulled the right side apart. And this is what I found. I don't know if you guys will be able to see that, but... Anything you can catch with your fingernail is real bad news. So that's junk. That's junk. That's junk. And then the camshaft back here also has corresponding grooves big enough to catch your fingernail. So this engine is pretty well pooched. Well I hate giving good people bad news but there's not a lot of good news on this engine. Probably the bottom end is okay. You know, we saw, we measured, we had good oil pressure, but the oil pressure is measured at the bottom end. The problem with these modular engines, with the VVT setup, and maybe it happened on the older ones too, I don't know. The two valve engines were a lot more reliable, so I haven't really been into one of them. But the problem with these three valve engines is the oil comes up towards the cylinder head on either side, and there's kind of a manifold right here behind where the tensioner is and the oil gets directed out to the camshaft up to the VCT solenoid and out to the tensioner and when the tensioner gaskets blow out you lose all your oil pressure going to the cylinder head so then you get erratic behavior with your VCT solenoid because if it doesn't have oil it can't advance the phaser so eventually you're going to have damage to the cam bearings and possibly damage to the roller followers and the lash adjusters and all that stuff because it's just a lack of oil making it to the top end of the engine. It's just a a really bad design. I don't know what what Ford was thinking. If they would have just made that gasket a little bit more robust or done it like what other companies do, you know, where they have the the tensioner is kind of a, a long bullet shaped design where it uses O-rings instead of a gasket like that, it probably would have been fine but they just they just got it wrong and then they made that that same wrong design for what I don't know, like seven years or eight years something like that I think from 2004 until I don't know 11 or something like that they used the same design anyway it's just it's just engineered to fail so the only way to fix this engine I guess there's a couple of options we could replace it with a used engine, we could replace it with a reman engine, or we could replace just the heads with reman heads. I asked the machine shop here, he said they don't rebuild them, they just buy remans and swap them out. He's getting me a quote on that, but I'm guessing it's going to be, I don't know, in the $1,200 range. A used engine is going to be $1,500. Either way, we've got to take the intake off, got to take the exhaust manifolds off. Uh, no matter what, we still have to do the timing chains because the junkyard engine, they won't warranty the timing chains. He told me that straight up because of the you know high number of, of failures with these engines. They won't even warranty them, so you have to replace them before you install the engine. And you know, obviously, if we keep this short block, we're still going to have to do the timing chains, probably do the oil pump and everything too. It's just it's going to add up to be a lot of money. All right, folks, I think we're going to cut it off here. I had a feeling this was going to be a good one. Or, or a bad one, depending how you want to look at it. This is more destruction than I expected to find inside of a 119,000 mile engine. It really is. Uh, I thought we were going get, to get lucky. I even told the customer I thought we might be able to just replace the phasers and that one VCT solenoid and send it down the road. But I'm glad we went a little deeper. Uh, there was obviously much more wrong with the truck than what first met the eye. And yeah, there just aren't any good options with these old 5.4s. You know, no matter what he does, he's going to have to spend a, a pile of money to get this thing back on the road. 
if he even chooses to put it back on the road. I don't know at this point. You just can't come out fixing the timing chains on these old trucks. Most of them are pretty rusty at this point. You know, you spend, let's say, 3000 up to maybe $4,500 at the dealership to get this problem fixed. There's no way these trucks, even in good condition with all the work done, might bring $4,000, maybe $3,500. So you're upside down on it pretty quickly. And you really have to feel sorry for the customer on this one. You know, he bought this truck about two months ago. The previous owner told him that it had a plugged catalytic converter, and that's why it was running poorly. He took it to a Ford dealership. The Ford dealership charged him $500. They changed the spark plugs. They told him they changed the coils and boots, which obviously they did not. I, I, there's no way those coils and boots are, are two months old. I, I just can't see it. Anyway, they charged him $500 for that work, and then they shipped it right out the door. Didn't say a word about the timing chains. Just let it go. And obviously it didn't fix the problem. And that's almost unbelievable to me. They had to hear that timing chain rattle. So I don't know if there's more to that story than what I'm being told or, or what's going on, but that is pretty ridiculous. Anyway, guys, I don't know what's going to happen, if there's going to be a part two or what this guy's going to do with this truck. They're just, like I said, really aren't any good options. So if he chooses to go forward with it, I will try to film it. If not, then I guess this is the end of the story. So thanks, guys, for watching, and I'll see you next time.